In this episode, we're going to explore the complexity of fuel delivery in a marine diesel. We'll learn about the Achilles elbow of a common design, and we'll go through the specific details of how to change both fuel filters in a Yanmar engine. Good morning. Diesel fuel is very different than gasoline. Of course, the first thing you notice is the odor, but it's also got an oily feel to it, a lubricity. Diesel fuel is as much an oil as it is a fuel. In fact, if you ever make the mistake of putting gasoline into a diesel engine, the problem you end up with is lack of lubrication. The other property of diesel is that at room temperature and ambient pressure, it doesn't burn very well. You notice here I'm trying to light it, and in fact the flame changes a bit when I get the flame near the little drip of diesel, but it won't light. On the other hand, if you compress diesel inside a cylinder, it explodes spontaneously with no need for ignition. All right, have a look at this. This is a mix of diesel and water that came out of a fuel tank recently. The two biggest enemies of diesel engines are water and dirt contamination of fuel. You can see the water at the bottom, and looking closely you can see how the water has pulled contaminants from the diesel and concentrated them underneath. The source of the water is mostly air above the fuel inside the tank, so you'll get more water when the tank is nearly empty and the volume of air above is large. When the temperature of the tank drops below the dew point overnight, dew condenses on the sidewall of the tank and then slides underneath the diesel to collect at the bottom near the fuel intake siphon. Now, modern cars have sophisticated evaporative control systems, but that's not the case with these old little diesels. This is the vent here, and it's free to atmosphere. When you fill up, you've got to make sure you don't fill it all the way to the top, because you need to have room for expansion with temperature and for healing over when the boat heals over. You don't want to pollute the waterway. Before we get started, I need to explain why even brief cranking of a marine diesel without starting the engine can hydrolock a cylinder and break a connecting rod or piston. You see, instead of a radiator, marine diesels use salt water to absorb heat from the engine. Waste salt water is then merged with exhaust gas at the exhaust elbow to muffle sound and to safely cool the exhaust hardware. As a weak point of the system, we sometimes call this the Achilles elbow, although the real problem is downstream at the waterlock muffler and beyond. Just past the waterlock muffler, there's a second vertical loop to the exhaust tree. This is there to prevent a following wave from back flooding the system. Notice how water in the exhaust has to rise significantly above the height of the engine before it can escape. When you crank the engine without starting, there isn't enough exhaust volume to lift that water over the second loop, but the salt water pump keeps drawing in more fluid. So water has to back up, possibly enough to overflow the exhaust elbow and flood the exhaust manifold. Here's the salt water intake on this boat. It's on a sail drive and so it's a bit hard to reach. I'm going to move the camera out of the way and crank that uh, brass screw clockwise until it's closed. Well, here we are in the aft cabin. This is our fuel tank and in keeping with the principles of a sailboat it needs to be down low and close to the center and um, there's the um, where the filler neck tube goes where's the, where you uh, add in fuel and uh, you can see the vent tube as well right there and there's a ground um, um, strap onto the uh, tank to prevent any static electricity. There's a fuel gauge there you can actually read it's about half full and um, here's our uh, shutoff valve, and we're going to be shutting that off. You can see there's the um, uh, intake uh, port to the um, fuel system, and then the return port. And also we've got a little port for the S-bar heating system to keep the sailboat warm in the nighttime. And when I open the fuel system down lower, I don't want it, the fuel in the tank to siphon right out. And so I'm going to turn our supply off. Now I'm going to be working alone, and so it's awkward for me to have to put the stairs back in climb up the stairs, turn the starter motor crank on, and then um, turn it off and then climb back down the stairs. Sometimes I need to do two things at once. And so I'm going to uh, hook up a hot wire starter to the starter motor. Now um, the starter uh, motor is here, and the solenoid is right here. And this is the wire that goes to the switch that uh, starts it. So when 12 bolts get to this point, then the starter motor, the, the solenoid will be activated and the starter motor will turn on. Now this point here is 12 volts, so I just need to jump between the two with a switch. And so I'm going to do that now. Now just to demonstrate it here, you've got to make sure everything is out of the way. You're not going to hurt yourself with this. And then you can just press this button. And the engine turns over. Alright, let's start with some basics. Um, fuel from the tank comes in here, goes through a check valve. Um, through the middle and uh, into the water separator and from the water separator it goes through a paper filter and then back out to the engine here 
we've got an air bleed screw right here, this little brass one, and then we've got a little um, pump right here which unscrews if you unscrew it. Um, now um, I'm going to drain this uh, fluid out, so I've set up a little tank here. This is the same procedure if you just want to drain water, but remember that if air bubbles get into your filter, that air needs to be cleared from the system so your engine won't stall. To remove air from this filter, open the bleed screw at the top, then pump the plunger until only diesel leaks at the top. Okay, starting to move on me. Now this uh, valve here is in case you want to use optional sensors for water or other other sensors and uh, you can plug them in but this is at the moment it's just a plug. Well that was on there tight. Now if you follow the um, fuel pathway out from the primary fuel filter it goes first into here which is the the pump and it's got this little butterfly valve that's actually run off the cam off the crankcase and uh, I can feel a sponginess to it here and that um, sucks uh, fuel up here and then forces it down through here and down through the secondary fuel filter. Now I need to get this off and so um, I don't have a small strap wrench handy but I do have a big screwdriver and a hammer, so I'm going to try uh, tapping it this way to see if it'll go. And indeed, it does move, so I got lucky this time. A small strap wrench might have been better. So I'll just spin this puppy off. I've got an absorbent pad underneath to catch any drips. filter. I just pulled on it and it dropped down. So there it is there. I have to check to see if there's a seal. There's a seal right here. It looks to be pretty good. You know, somebody will ask, this is my part number from Yanmar. And uh, I think you can buy the seals as well. I didn't do that this time. And then I've got to clean that out a little bit inside the bowl. So I'll put it back in and then screw it on. Now some people would fill this with fresh fuel. I don't actually have any fresh fuel at hand right now, so we're going to have to pump that in. Um, that'll take a while. I've got the bowl nice and clean. Um, the new filter came with an O-ring and I'm just gonna dab it down with um, diesel and uh, slide it on. It looks like it fits pretty well. And then This is the end that screws in here. You see it's nice and clean there. Now they suggest filling it with clean diesel, but I don't have any clean diesel and I don't have any diesel that's been filtered to 10 microns and so I'm going to have to pump it from the um, tank. It's going to take quite a bit longer. Here's the new filter. Here's the new uh, uh, O-ring on this side. So you probably don't notice it, but this O-ring has got a chamfer to it, whereas the other one was uh, square. Um, not quite sure what to make of that. But uh, I'm going to put it in this way. Mostly you lubricate these so that when they spin on they don't be pulled out of round and they won't create a leak. Because a leak is your biggest worry. Um, I've checked the mating surface and it seems to be nice and clean. So now we'll just slide it on. Before my battery dies, I'll just point out that there's a little, this thing is asymmetric. The hole goes up. Don't put it in backwards. It goes on tight. So I'll push it up there. There we are. It clips up into place and holds itself. That's kind of nice. Now we don't want to cross thread it. 
remember working upside down counterclockwise is closed. Now the next part can be the worst of it and the, the reason is that it can be hard to get that uh, air valve, um, that little butterfly valve um, purging all of the air. And um, so it becomes an issue of um, if you have air in the line, air is very compressible and a, a valve that relies on suction just sucks the air and the air changes its uh, pressure and it, it absorbs the energy without uh, sucking up any of the much more viscous um, diesel fluid. So right now I'm opening the um, air bleeder valve and um, the idea behind doing this is so that when I open the tank valve I'm hoping that by gravity um, fluid from the tank will go through the, the one-way valve and fill up this and the bleeder valve will bleed all the air off and allow me to at least get to this level before I have to uh, use the uh, butterfly valve to suck it up the rest of the way. That's as close as my tripod will let you get. But watch for little bubbles right there and you can actually, I can actually see them. There, do you see that? I'll close the petcock. That took longer than I thought it would. So by um, uh, uh, filling the uh, filter with diesel, that makes it a lot uh, less volume that you have to um, uh, suck up with the uh, butterfly valve inefficiently using a suction system. Um, this is uh, this system works more by positive pressure and is easier. I'm going to have to torque that up a little bit with the wrench. Um, this one screws into place as well. Okay, let's move on to the butterfly valve. So, um, fuel is uh, got air in it here, up to the butterfly valve, and that's the valve right there. We press, and then fuel goes through here, and up to th this um, uh, secondary filter. And so, um, this is a 10 millimeter wrench. It seems to fit, and we need to undo this bleeder valve, this bleeder screw. It's not that tight, and so it doesn't have to be all the way undone. Just a little bit, and we're just gonna um, crank it till we see diesel coming through there. So you watch for me. This can take a while because I've got to fill up that whole cavity. Is that a little better? I sped this up so you don't get bored. If you don't want to use the starter motor, this will work, but removing air from the upstream line takes more patience than I had today. All right, this is taking too long. Um, now these things here, this one here, and this one here, and this one here, these are called decompression valves, and I'm going to hold them open. And by doing that, it prevents the engine from starting. And then I'm going to use the starter motor to turn that pump and try and get it going quicker. Now you only want to do this for um, 10 seconds or less, so we'll hit it for 10 seconds. You'll notice a different sound. Sounds more like a sewing machine. That's the sound of no compression. It's the same sound you'd get if you had a a vehicle that had a broken timing belt, uh, you're not getting compression. So I'm holding these decompression valves open and then we'll turn it over. Okay, let's go look and see if we have had an effect. Now we have to leave it for a minute or two to allow the wires to cool down because this is hard on the starter motor. Okay, that did it. You can see the diesel right here. The diesel fuel, it's dripping, so I'm going to clean it up now. Now we can close this part off and continue pumping. Okay, we've got it bled to here, and now we need to bleed this line here that goes up to the high pressure pump, and it comes up around and then goes right into, let's see, that not right there. Now um, it's actually easier for you to see it than for me. So that uh, one with the Phillips head screw, so we're going to have it right there. Um, I'm going to try and set up the camera so you can see it and uh, I'll go in from the front because it's easier to reach from the front. Just awkward the way I'm sitting. We'll undo that and we'll do the same thing. Okay, I just barely managed to get this 10 millimeter wrench onto there, but I got the box end wrench on. The Phillips head screw was too tight for me. You can see it right there. And then I bumped the starter motor over again with the decompression valves released and just a, about a six second pump and I got diesel fluid coming out of there. And so now I'll crack it off, and we're almost done our bleeding up to the point of the high pressure valves. Now at this point, we're going to uh, tighten these all up and hope that the 
engine starts because bleeding the high pressure system is a little bit more complex. Um, now I've pushed the decompression valves all forward so that uh, now the engine should be able to start if it wants to. It may take a while, um, so we'll give it a bump and see if we can get it going. There we are, that didn't take much. Let's run it a bit and see what happens. Now it's really important you check for leaks at this point. This is your last chance. Keep your hand away from the belt because it's going to be a big issue if you get your hand caught. I've not seen any leaking so far. I'll go back to the back of the engine and check again. I can't leave it going for very long because I got the seacock turned off, so I'm going to turn that back on now. Let's shut the engine off. And we'll get the seacock open. Now the brains of the fuel system are in the high pressure pump, and it's right behind there. The uh, intriguing thing I find about it is there are no wires. This is run mechanically off of the camshaft. It's purely mechanical. And in fact, to adjust the timing, you, you adjust a shim right in there. Now the high pressure pump delivers individual boluses of fluid to each cylinder. You see there are three, three tubes and three cylinders. And so um, up each of those comes a bolus of high pressure fluid exactly timed for when the um, cylinder is on the intake cycle. Now the three injectors are here. Here's one here. Here's the second right there, and there's the third injector there, and they each have their individual tubing. Now, these injectors are very simple. They've got a spring, and the spring holds the pintle closed until such time as the pressure rises enough to open the pintle. So again, no wires. It delivers a bolus of fluid exactly timed. Now, you'll notice this tubing here. Do you see that right there? And the reason for this is that um, when you're dealing with a volume-driven system, if you have excess fluid, you need some way to get rid of it. And what happens is that this scavenges any uh, leftover fluid and sends it back to the fuel tank to be recycled. Finally, let's go to the governor, which is right here, sitting right beside the high-pressure injector pump here. Now, you want a governor in these vehicles uh, because you want to be able to control engine speed in the setting of variable load. This governor works by centrifugal action. There really are only two controls for this governor. The first is the uh, stop um, lever right here, and it's controlled by a cable. The cable's disconnected at the moment, but you pull on the cable and it shuts off fuel delivery through the injector pumps. The second cable that is um, important is this one right here, and this is what they call the regulator cable. Now, in a gasoline engine, they'd call that the throttle cable, but in fact, um, the word throttle implies uh, starving for oxygen, and this has nothing to do with air. This is all about fuel. So adjusting the length of this cable adjusts the amount of fuel that's being delivered to the engines and hence adjusts the engine RPM. So that's about it. This cable right here is the regulator cable and look at how melted it is. Somebody put this in too close to the exhaust manifold so I'm going to have to replace this cable. Isn't that awful? Well I hope you found this video as interesting to watch as I found it to make. Later this year, I hope to do another video on the marine cooling systems, which are very different than in a normal car. This system has two water pumps and no radiator. I hope you'll stay tuned, and thanks for watching.